So welcome to the students who are in the audience and also our friends and colleagues who are on Zoom and also streaming on YouTube. Um, we have a, some special remarks from our assemblyman, Chris Ward, and I'd like to share that uh, those remarks with you. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Ward, and I have the honor of representing the 78th Assembly District in the California State Legislature. I want to thank you all for joining UC San Diego Design Labs and California 100 for this important seminar featuring distinguished academic and industry speakers. Whether you are here in person or attending virtually, you can expect an engaging conversation with an extraordinary group of leaders who reflect the diversity and expertise that California is known for around the world. Again, thank you all for attending and ensuring that your voice is heard on some of California's most pressing issues. Well, he did say that we are here with some esteemed speakers from industry and also academia. So uh, we're really excited about this discussion. Um, you know, today we're going to talk about the factors that make us healthy. And when we think about these things, we often think diet and exercise, right? People always tell us diet and exercise and, and maybe sleep. They might throw in sleep there. But um, what if I told you that your health outcomes, uh, uh, a large portion of your health outcomes are predicted even before you were born? That the things that predict your health outcomes are often related to social and structural determinants. So wh what are social and structural determinants? Um, they are your parents' background, their education, their, their occupation, their wealth, those are big predictors of your health outcomes. Where they bought a house, the house that they bought, whether it's affordable, what kind of neighborhood they located in has predictive um, outcomes for your health. Right? We've talked about affordable housing in this class, and we've talked about its impact on health. I think I've mentioned that, because I'm a housing scholar, that when I think about health, uh, that housing is health. That is a, a huge part of uh, shaping our health outcomes. Um, how many of you have a cell phone, a smartphone? Okay, so everybody has a smartphone, right? So w what if I said that this smartphone is one of the, has the biggest potential to actually address, address some of these health disparities that we have in our society? It's, it's the most common technology that is is um, is equitable. 85% uh, of our population has a smartphone, and that's true across race and ethnicity. Um, and so it has a lot of potential, but whether or not we actually utilize it to um, bridge the gap between health outcomes, to address health disparities, that's something that I think we'll get to today and talk about you know, what are some health innovations? What are some technological innovations that will actually um, help us to uh, address health disparities? Um, I, I wish Marty Cooper were here. He might show up a little bit later. So if he does, I'll, I'll identify who he is. But uh, the, we have a guest that that is on his way, is the um, inventor of the cell phone. So he, you can thank him for the this invention that will hopefully help us to address health health equity. Um, you have the California 100 report you're, you were supposed to read, and in that report it said that about 40% of our health outcomes can be predicted on, on social and structural uh, determinants. That's a pretty big number. Um, and, you know, we haven't done a good job of addressing uh, these social and structural determinants. So I'm going to turn it over to Karthik Ramakrishnan, Executive Director of California 100, to talk about California's future and whether or not we're doing a better job than nationally, where you know still 30 million people don't have access to health care. Right? Thank you, Mai. Uh, and thank you all for, uh, for being here. Uh, we have one of our lead researchers on the uh, future scenarios reports. So I'm not going to steal too much of uh, her thunder uh, in terms of what she's going to say. But I'll, I'll say on a personal note, not only am I the executive director of California 100, I'm also a board member um, on the California Endowment, which for over a decade has been uh, investing in communities precisely to change some of those structural determinants with the hope that they will lead to more equitable health outcomes. 
And we've seen some progress so in, in San Diego County. Um, City Heights has been one of those 14 building, building healthy community sites. What we discovered over time is that even if you can bring the preponderance of evidence to bear and show decision makers that this is the right thing to do to build more equitable systems that will improve not only health but well, well-being in many ways, um, systems have inertia for various reasons. And one of our major discoveries, not surprising to me as a political scientist, is that, um, that often uh, decision makers uh, will throw up roadblocks, either intentionally or unintentionally, and that you need to build power, especially among uh, those most affected or most disadvantaged, so that they have the capacity to not only advocate, but to push systems to do the right thing. Now, with all of that said, I've always found that there is a tale of two worlds when it comes to advancing health. There are the people who are working on health equity with a social determinants lens and a power building kind of layer, if you will, or maybe a power building lens to that work. And then there are those that are working on health innovation, largely in the technology space, and especially post George Floyd, but even prior to that, are attuned to the problems of health disparities and health inequities. But these two worlds rarely intersect with each other. So I'm hoping that what we get today is to model the kinds of conversations, and especially in a place like San Diego, where for more than a decade you've had significant investments in, um, in improving uh, social, you know, addressing uh, some of those root causes of health disparities and focusing on power building. But you also have this amazing biotechnology sector if there is a place in California, and I would say in the country, that can hopefully bridge these two worlds, I think it's San Diego. So I'm hoping that this will be the beginning of a more, I mean, I already know that you know, going upstairs at the design lab, some of these conversations are already happening. I just think we just need to increase the volume and intensity of this work, and I'm really excited uh, with the conversation today, uh, and you know, just as importantly, at the kind of ideas that'll spark with all of you uh, in the audience and with uh, the amazing researchers that are affiliated with the Design Lab. Yeah, no, I, th I agree with you. I think that we're at a moment where the technological advances, as well as our understanding that we need to address health disparities and the importance of that, have come together at a moment where we can really move the needle yeah. uh, on this. And we have to be intentional about it, right? Because what we've seen often is when it comes to early adoption and technology, it actually ends up reinforcing disadvantage before yeah. it starts ameliorating disadvantage. And hopefully we can design better. Well, this is a good, good to segue future. to turning to our panelists to actually address some of these issues. So let's welcome our panelists. So I'm going to start. I'm going to start with Chris. Chris Longhurst is the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Digital Officer at UC San Diego Health. He works alongside leaders at UCSD Health and School of Medicine and UC Health to improve care delivery and oversees UCSD's health's reputation for delivering safe, innovative, patient-centered care. And Dr. Longhurst is really passionate about implementing innovative digital solutions that help improve the patient experience. So Chris, um, I've read in, on, in your bio that you grew up in a, in rural area, in a rural area, and that really shaped how you think about access and to medicine and also technology. And I was hoping that you could give us an overview of the advances in technology in uh, health systems. Because I've heard you say digital health is not a strategy. It's a tool that is used to help accomplish your goals as a health system. So maybe you can elaborate on that. Absolutely. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure and privilege to be here. I really want to thank you for the invitation to uh, have this important conversation. And you're right, I grew up on a farm uh, in rural Northern California. And uh, my first introduction to technology was when my father brought home a computer that had a modem. And this is before I had a driver's license. And so I was able to plug it in the wall and start interacting with people all over the region and the, the country. And that spar sparked some of my uh, interest in technology that continued throughout my undergraduate career here at UC San Diego, where I was a Ravel student, and uh, subsequently at medical school at UC Davis, where uh, I uh, decided to become a pediatrician. So um, my journey has been somewhat circuitous. I actually returned to the UC system 
partly because of the mission of the UCs to serve the underserved in the entire community and region. And uh, as a pediatrician, this is really near and dear to my heart. Every child deserves an equal chance. And I partnered with Dr. Nadine Burke, who's our California Surgeon General on the Adverse Childhood Event um, uh, uh, Prevention and uh, Detection uh, Program. And importantly, we baked that into our electronic health records so that we could become more highly reliable in how we did that. Now, as the chief medical officer overseeing a lot of our inpatient care, we take a careful look at all of our quality and safety dashboards on a very regular basis to make sure that we're delivering not only safe care, but equitable care. And part of that journey is really understanding what is equitable care and how do we define that and is the data trustworthy? And so uh, over the last five years, one of our more important journeys has been diving deeper into these data elements that we collect to make sure that they're valid, that they're verifiable, and that they're true. Because uh, it turns out, for example, that our race and ethnicity data that we collected in an electronic health record wasn't very good. And so we went through several cycles of improvement to try to um, get more integrity around that data. And guess what we found out? We found out things like we weren't offering tobacco cessation uh, counseling at the same rates to people of different races. And uh, of course, nobody is out there consciously thinking, I don't want to offer this individual or that patient the same services. But when you surface this information in a way that's believable, it really changes the conversation. Be people become more aware of these implicit biases. And in fact, we're able to very rapidly uh, address that and uh, make our care more equitable across uh, uh, UC San Diego Health. We found a number of other examples like that, and of course the latest is during the COVID pandemic when an unintended uh, digital divide emerged, particularly among people who didn't have bandwidth uh, for telehealth, right? There was a point in time in, in April of 2020 when 70% of our outpatient care was being delivered via telemedicine because people were nervous about coming in, both our patients and our, our clinicians in some uh, examples. And today we're still at 20 or 30 percent, but it's a challenge that we continue to face is how do we ensure that our access from a telemedicine standpoint is equitable? You mentioned the smartphone as a really key tool, and, and we found that it helps to close the digital divide, but it doesn't help to close the whole bandwidth divide. And as we serve patients in Imperial County, uh, those of you who have driven east on the 8 know you drop your cell service, right? Um, and so uh, there's still continued challenges in ensuring equitable access to the care that we want to offer to everybody in the community, everybody in the region. So thank you again for the uh, opportunity to be here and look forward to the uh, conversation. Thanks, Chris. Um, Karthik might know a few things about collecting data. He started the AAPI, what is it called? An API data. API data. Um, and uh, that has been a great resource actually for collecting better quality data on AAPI populations. So um, you, you can talk afterwards. Um, I'm going to turn to Nanez Ponce. Um, she's a professor at the Fielding School of Public Health's Department of Health Policy and Management and the director of its Center for Health Policy Research at UCLA. She leads the health, California Health Interview Survey, which is the nation's largest state health survey and, a, and is recognized as a national model for data collection on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and gender identity and immigrant health. <coughs> Excuse me. And she's received numerous awards from community organizations recognizing her work in community-engaged work. Nanez, you were instrumental in this California 100 report on, on health. Um, and I wanted to maybe turn a little bit to California and talk about the California Department of Healthcare Services where, um, and, and their CalAIM uh, initiative. And this initiative, this plan, really explicitly aims to increase whole person health access across the state. Right, building on the existing programs, California is actually you know, pretty innovative in terms of trying to get more and more people access to health care, uh, health insurance. But will will CalAIM really get us to universal um, health coverage in California? We still have an eight percent gap in those who are uninsured. Right? Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, the four-letter word I love is data. So when you were talking <laughs> about data, so I, I started really we were thinking about By the way, Nanez, I consider Nanez the OG when it comes to collecting data on race and That's racial state, and ethnic yeah. populations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, I, so Cal AIM. Um, I don't think Cal AIM will get us to universal 
coverage, that's it, the financing piece, but I think it gets us better at health equity because CalAIM is um, out of um, the Medi-Cal program. How many people here know what the Medi-Cal program is? Because all of you should be insured, right, Th through, through um, your registration, through your enrollment here. But Medi-Cal is a program um, that, that covers um, poor people in California, and uh, there's a lot of poor people. At one point, uh, Medi-Cal covered one in, you know, at 33 percent of Californians. So it's a, uh, it's not, we're not going to get to the whole, to the uh, entire state, but it's a large part of the state, and it's the state that needs the most help. And health equity is giving people what they need, and not necessarily giving everybody the same share. So what Calim. Um, tries to do is both from a financing perspective, I'm a health economist, so I think you, you, know, you really need to have the incentives to make people give better care, coordinate care, incentives, I'm really trying to get incentives to collect better race ethnicity data. Um, and um, and it's, it's also getting at um, interoperability, which I think we use a lot, at least in my world, but they don't really know how to do it. So there is at least this financing mechanism, but not like how do you do it? So this is sort of why I was very interested to be here, my and Karthik, because we have an idea of like how to do it or what we need to do, but not exactly how to implement. And I do think that the behavioral individual part, so California could be very individualistic and you can have reforms and innovations at the individual level, which I think there's a place for that. So there's a place for the reminders on your cell phone. There's a place for that. But really what we need some tech thinking and brains on is how do you make systems behave better? How do you make systems track a patient through the life cycle of, and actually Cal AIM gets at those who are formerly incarcerated. You know, so how do you get that and who will have clinic, you know, really they're socially complex, clinically complex patients how do you connect all those systems? So hopefully, so Cal AIM is for the poorest, the poor, the, the most marginalized um, people in California, and um, it gets at integrated data, interoperable systems, integrating behavioral health with physical health, healthy aging, getting at you know um, aging um, aging well and not in in your communities in your homes. So it's. Uh, it's very exciting, but it's, it's largely in the Medi-Cal program, not for the commercially insured at this point. But I think we can get there sooner with help from tech and uh, innovations that come from the public sector. Great, thank you. Tavai, um, I'm, I'm gonna turn to you next. Um, Tavai Samailu is the daughter of a pastor, and I think that's important for you to put in your bio, right? From uh, Lulu Moga and a nurse, um, and you're a daughter of a nurse from Sa Salameo, and you're currently the executive director of the Empowering Pacific Islander Community, and uh, where you really advocate passionately for your people, and you're really committed to liberation for all. I'm going to ask you about the importance of recognizing innovation um, that can take a number of different forms, right, including indigenous knowledge, and you know. Oftentimes, indigenous knowledge doesn't get recognized, doesn't get um, uh, incorporated into our science, our research, our education, and often is forgotten and considered to be the past or traditional. So what's the important importance of incorporating indigenous knowledge into our education and research, and how will that actually help us to accelerate human progress? Thank you for that. Uh, so as Mai said, my name is Tavai Samwelu. My pronouns are she, her. I have the honor of being the executive director of EPIC. And the reason why my bio very explicitly states that I'm the daughter of a pastor from Leulumuenga and a nurse from Salemo because it is indigenous practice to talk about the lands that you're from and the people who have helped to shape all of your notions of power and privilege and systems. Um, in addition to being honored to be a guest here at UC San Diego, I'm especially privileged to be a guest here on Kumeyaay lands. And if we're gonna talk about indigeneity, I need to be really explicit about who the original stewards are. 
and put forth the question, not only about acknowledgement, because anywhere you go, you're on indigenous land, but what is the work that we're collectively doing to return the land to indigenous hands? And it's deeply tied to what it means to include indigenous knowledge. Now, in preparation for this panel, I actually found myself needing to look up the definitions of, of innovation and technology, um, because they're terms that have been used to a point of semantic satiation. They're used so often that they've lost all meaning. Uh, at the end of the day, innovation is really marked by this notion of new methods, by novelty. And I approach it with a certain amount of trepidation, especially as someone who comes from colonized people whose cultures and knowledges were erased intentionally, languages that were suppressed and banned for a very long time, until the 1970s, it was illegal for Native Hawaiians to speak Native Hawaiian. And the purpose of language is the ways in which all of our knowledge is disseminated through that production, through that retention of language. So the other aspect of why I have some reticence around innovation is because how often things are marked as novel to others that have been long put part of our, our genetic memory as a community, things that we've always known how to do especially as we think about as Pacific people who traverse the oceans reading our environment, because we had such a deep connection to land and water that we understood and knew just by looking at the sky and the waves exactly where we were supposed to go. These things that now would be considered innovation, but for us are a reclamation and the ways that we really find ourselves at a precipice of bearing witness to its evolution, of the ways that we tailor things. In technology, thinking about the practical application of knowledge. Uh, so for me, it's as simple as, in some, <laughs> for someone attire, uh, there's pulkasis, long worn for, for hundreds of years. My mom's innovation was to add pockets. <laughs> She was tired of carrying purses, and so now everything I have has pockets in it. And this, for me, it was this brilliant addition to making this very traditional attire functional and something more forming for all of the ways that we go around in the world, for making it easier to serve our communities. Because the other things that we learned from scholars like Bell Hooks to talk about theory, what use is a tool if it doesn't bring us closer to equity and, fr and freedom and liberation? The other aspect about thinking of indigenous knowledge and even protocol is even in thinking about part, being part of the California 100 Commission, I pushed back with Karthik. I'm simultaneously too old and not young enough to be on this commission, uh, that so much of our indigenous protocols are about deference to elders, the folks who often hold all of that knowledge that we so desperately need, that we need to hold on to and remember and also knowing that we are in this place of remembering and also knowing so much of what's been retained has been through a colonial lens. And that when I look at young people and the things that they're doing, that they're evolving things, that they're making decisions that work for, for their generations and knowing that I ultimately want a future that's shaped by, you know, by and for my four-year-old niece, Lavinia. And it's, I love that we're talking to you all as students because I think of the words of, of folks like Huey P. Newton who said that the revolution is always in the hands of young people. And even as folks are talking about data, the disaggregated data we have now is because Native Hawaiian students at Stanford flagged it for then Senator Akaka. They said the data that we see on paper does not match our lived experiences. So an understanding as well that data and other technologies that are often understood to be neutral actually aren't that what is understood as objectivity is very often white male subjectivity, and the questions that are at hand, knowing that what you are able to do, the curiosity that you can elevate that actually leads to equitable innovation is actually the things that you're best suited to do. And that young people have always taught me just sort of moving with this urgency of not needing to wait your turn to lead, of not needing to wait your turn in this I think what is often deemed impatience is actually wanting to be really clear, when did we learn to wait for freedom? When did we learn to wait to do the right thing? And so really wanting to continue to be pushed 
by young people, by students like you, who are in the best position to hold systems and universities accountable. Now you precisely know why she had to be one of our commissioners <laughs> to buy. So is she too young or too old? <laughs> no. Tavai, Tavai just is, as you just, we're just bearing witness yeah. to Tavai right now. Well, you know, we, we had a, um, a design-a-thon on wildfires, and um, these scientists said, you know, we should really do more controlled burns, and then some indigenous folks says, we've been doing them for centuries. <laughs> Maybe you should learn from us. So I think that's a really important point. Camille, I'm going to turn to you. Camille Nebaker is an associate professor with appointments in, with the UC San Diego Design Lab, woo, and the School of Public Health and Human Longevity. She's also the director of the UC San Diego Research Ethics Program, and she applies human-centered design approaches to shape ethical research practices. Um, Camille, you were instrumental in developing the Cal Notify app, that exposure app, you know, right when COVID hit, right? Um, they quickly designed, prototyped, and then uh, created an app. Um, it was a pretty fast process, right? And one of your goals was really to reach as many people, a diverse population, as possible and use human-centered design approaches. Maybe you could tell us about that process and whether you think you were successful at, um, at making an app that actually di was, did reach a diverse population and whether or not, what, what you've learned from that process moving forward, if we can create other exposure apps, what would you do differently? Well, thank you. And thank you for hosting this important conversation because health equity and technology, we have, we have a long way to go and we're making progress. And I have to thank Dr. Longhurst for inviting me to be a part of the development of CA Notify. How many of you in this room have it activated? How many in this room have not heard of it? Okay, so in, in September of 2020, we wanted to do what we could to help people who were in the public know if they had been exposed to, CA, to, to COVID. And so the traditional way that we've done this in the past is through con, uh, contact notification, which is a manual process that when you are identified as having a positive test, the public health workers will ask you who you have been around, where you were, when were you there, and then proceed to put together a map of your contacts and then call each and every one of them. And I don't know about you, but I rarely answer my phone. So it's not a practice that I think is gonna be terribly efficient or effective. And, and we were invited to pilot the CA Notify system to design and pilot this at UC San Diego. And as a research ethicist, I'm really interested in what the person's experience is and what we need to do to make that experience something that is uh, sustainable, especially for research, health research. We want our participants to not only join a study because they're informed and they know what they're getting into, but to stay with the study because they were informed and they agreed to participate. So thinking about what would we need to think about prospectively in order to design a system that people would actually accept and find useful was to start talking to people. And fortunately, at, at UC San Diego, our employees, inclu including staff and students and our employees, are quite diverse and represent a nice cross-section of, of Californians. In San Diego County, we have a, a, the second largest Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community. We have a majority of Latino uh, residents. Um, we have a very large refugee population. So here in San Diego, we have access to diversity that is really un unusual. The other population that I think is really important to consider, especially with a CA Notify um, exposure notification system, is older adults people who are using public transportation, people who are essential workers. So to get started, we started talking to people. So we, first of all, and this was even before we started with um, the pilot, we had the opportunity to be a part of a speculative design series of, of workshops that was hosted by the Design Lab. So in September, 
Before the pilot started, we had a speculative design workshop that 75 people attended virtually. And we were able to break people up into working groups that represented students, staff, and faculty. What would you be thinking if somebody asked you to activate CA Notify on your phone? What would you be worried about? What would be the barriers to acceptance and the facilitators to its use? And people told us what they were worried about. They worried about, is this a government program? Well, in some cases, the government hasn't treated our communities very well. And so I don't know that I could trust it. Well, what could make it trustworthy? So we, we had interactions. and. The worry about UC San Diego being involved in this, you know, are they trying to take my data? Are they linking my data to my health record? There were, there were a lot of worries about privacy, about data management, about access. Uh, do I have the right kind of phone? Are we leaving people behind? Um, so we took every single bit of that information and moved it forward to other design workshops, and we did several rapid design workshops. And again, I have to thank Dr. Longhurst and the team for really recognizing how important it was to engage with people to find out what would make this something acceptable, and you're only gonna have a, something that's adopted if people find it acceptable, and there has to be a value proposition. And what was that value proposition? Well, people wanted to, to keep their pods happy and safe. So if you had created a small group of people that you knew were your social lifelines at that point in time and you wanted to keep them safe, then that might be why you would start using this. Because when you go to the market to pick up something, you're around people who you don't know. And even if a traditional contact tracer were to ask you, you wouldn't know who was at the grocery store or who was in line at the bookstore next to you. So this is a tool that Google and Apple created the foundational platform for with privacy in mind. They knew that they could work together and that they could build a powerful tool, but it had to have privacy at the forefront. So those of you who have activated it, either on an Android phone or an iOS, we have no idea who you are. And that limits a lot of what we can know about whether this is useful and effective. But we, you know, we have taken every precaution to protect people's privacy so that you can receive a notification anonymously and take action and do what you need to do to keep your, your community safe. And, and so every, every time I work on anything to do with whether it's technology development or creating curriculum to reach underrepresented populations, I always involve those people in the conversations very early on so that we can understand what the lived experiences are and what the barriers are. And, and funny story, health tech company Giant contacted me about two years ago through the design lab. They had found a paper that we had published on, on what technologies would make would be useful to older adults to help them live independently longer. And we spent a lot of time in a retirement community working with people living independently to find out what technologies were they using, why did they use them, what were they worried about, what would be a game you know, showstopper. Um, we learned all about that. And then health tech company giant said, what made you think to talk to people? We've only really focused on people who are 18 to 36, and I'm, I, I was, I'm speechless now, and I was speechless then. It was like, I can't believe that that would be a question at this day and age, to not talk to people, to inform the design of anything you're making, and then to continue to iteratively get feedback and get feedback, and so a year ago, we, we continued to do the workshops. We went into Chula Vista, a local community. We conducted workshops in Spanish with women and men from Chula Vista to find out why might people like you and, and people in the demographic that you're in not want to use this tool. Well, it turned out the word Bluetooth was not understood and it was fearful. And that was the technology that was making this a really safe technology to use. It was the pr privacy protection that instead of using GPS, Bluetooth was the privacy key. Well, they didn't know what it meant and they were worried that everything in their phone could be snatched in the, uh, the shopping mall if their Bluetooth was on. 
So we took that immediately to Google and Apple and said, we need a really easy way of explaining how this works. And then we took it back and we tested that language with the people who were telling us that they were worried about it. And that kind of interface with people, you know, whether it be in Chula Vista or City Heights, we have to take the time to do that kind of work. And I hope that every single one of you in here will think about when you design anything that's for public consumption, that you take the time to engage with people who might want to use it and benefit from it. So thanks for the question. Thank you. So I'll have the next round of questions. But actually, I'm going to go back to Ninez, because Ninez, I was hoping they could talk a little bit about the the, the scenarios, right, that was, that, that was part of your report. And then I want to come back to some kind of best practices kind of questions, uh, you know, when it comes to inclusive tech and equitable tech. But Ninez, if you could just say a bit more about the kind of future scenarios work that you and the team worked on. Sure. So um, California 100 was this really bold project that Karthik is the, one of the architects, along with Henry Brady, on um, trying to get out of the myopia of, um, of term limits for decision makers, right? Two years, and then it's like the next. What am I going to run for next? Um, and so part of that decision-making myopia then might be one reason that, that curtails why we don't have universal coverage for all, why we don't have better care for all, why we don't take care of, um, of people who are unhoused, why we don't take care of children, your pediatrician. You know, do you know we have one of the highest child poverty rates in the nation, in California, and the highest food, food insecurity rates for children? So and we also have one yeah. of the uh, highest uh, rates of uh, children being insured, which helps with pediatric care, but doesn't solve a lot of these social and structural determinants. Exactly. So it's this community piece um, that Mai said, actually it's uh, 40%, it can actually, some, some theoretical frameworks and some evidence, it's actually up to 80% are non-clinical in terms of social determinants of health. So what we were tasked to do from, by Carthic, California 100, was imagine California 100 years from now, not exactly 100 years, but you know, at least more than two years, at least more than 10 years, maybe 20 years from now, for your children, your grandchildren, and I, I guess most of you here are from California, maybe not, but if you are not, most of you may want to stay here. Um, and we looked at these scenarios, we looked at four scenarios with the kind of the levers of do you want a system that's, um, that's just very siloed, or do you want a system that's more integrated? So sort of the extremes. Um, and do you want a system that's more individualistic, or do you want a system that's more community-oriented? Um, I use the word communitarian, but Henry Brady, the political scientist, did not want me to use the word communitarian. Um, so, so and now you get the last word, then I was there. We go. Since he's not in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and um, and we have been operating. Um, uh, we, I mean, we've evolved from the beginnings of the nature of what health insurance is, which is, you know, you're not you're not um, you're not insuring yourself to get sick because you don't know if you're going to get sick. I mean, that's that's a random event, but you're insuring yourself for the financial risks that you'll incur when you get sick. Um, and so the beginnings of the insurance system is more like a sickness system. So do you want it to be a sickness system, that's the other part, or do you want it to be a wellness system? So we looked at these scenarios and obviously what we want, well not obviously, as a public health <laughs> person, we wanted to, have to make sure things were integrated because it's not just about the symptoms that are presented to doctor's offices, but it's all that backstory that occurred. Um, it's childhood adverse experiences that occurred. So it's, it's where you live, or maybe you, where you, you, you may be living in a car because you're, you're unhoused. So there's all of this that we thought that you want systems to be in, uh, interoperable so that we would know about um, your caregiver. You know, you would know about where you get long-term services and supports if you're, um, if you need those supports because you're disabled or you're, um, you're, uh, you're, you're becoming frail as you get older. 
Um, we want to know, um, we want to look at social services. So if you're formerly incarcerated or you have a family member who's just, you know, getting out of justice-involved systems, that we then want to know, do you have the social supports, the economic supports, the mental health supports? Even mental and physical health is not well integrated in our systems here. So integrating that. So it is about not just computers talking to each other. That's not what interoperability is about. It's not the only thing it's about. It's really about people talking to each other. And so it's about, that's how the systems get to work. So this, this, these scenarios then is what we thought to get there, then we have to have an interoperable system. And so CalAIM is at least, it's just a five year kind of experiment. We hope it could be more than that. But it's something that where at least the California Department of Healthcare Services uh, which is a big payer here for healthcare in California um, for, for the Medi-Cal program, that at least they are going to invest in more of this connectivity um, and care coordination and, and also um, then that we get at, um, that we also get at this communitarian piece, so not individual, so where we know during COVID that finally I think people got, as an economist, these idea of infectious disease having externalities. That it's not just about individual costs, there's external community costs. And so we're all in this together. And so behavior then, individual behavior, has ramifications on community, communitarian benefits and harms. And so if we get into those values of being more communitarian, values of connecting and communicating and being more in interoperable, if we can build a better mousetrap that way, then we'll have a better health system. Great. Thank you, Nunez. Um, and final kind of coda to that, I mean, I, one of the things I found super fascinating, Nunez, when you and I were speaking through this, is that some of the biggest innovations that we can see in the next five years will likely come from the public sector, the public sector. where people typically don't think of as like, engines of innovation, but in California, it seems like that there's, there's a lot of promise I there. I can tell you, can I just, just really sure. insert why? It's cost. Right. <laughs> cost is, is oftentimes the driver, and so the systems are built for the most complex patients, so children with, with special care needs, uh, older populations, so cost is driving the need for innovation, whether we like it or not. But it's but, it's but one the state is equation. in a position to do something about it because it is involved in all these different systems, right? Right, because you can yeah. you know you can you can spend you can choose to spend your money in other ways. Right. Well, I want to go to um, to Vi and, and thinking especially in terms of um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities in California in the context of COVID. We talk about kind of data gaps and how. I mean. It, in, our, in, in the case of COVID, I mean, just deadly consequences, lack of investments in communities because they just were not on the radar of decision makers. What are some of your hopes, you know, in terms of building more equitable systems from what we've learned from COVID as it involves Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities as well as other communities similarly situated? Yeah, thank you for that. I put my mic down because I was ready to just, you know, listen and, <laughs> and not speak anymore. Um, I think some, a lot of things come up when you ask a question like that. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about some of the things that, that Camille surfaced and the shock at the fact that they wouldn't think to talk to people. Um, a lot of the work that Epic does and the, our research in particular is grounded in the scholarship of Dr. Linda Tweevi Smith, who wrote Decolonizing Methodologies. And it was this piece that was about listen, like, I know our people don't trust research because we've been exploited for so long, but I need you to know that we've always been researchers. And we have ways of producing and disseminating knowledge that center our people and understand that our elders are just as much an expert as a PhD student. So when talk about COVID, there are a lot of ways that the dominant narrative really posited our people as inherently unhealthy. That we had COVID because we were obese, because we are diabetic, because we have heart disease, all of these things that are symptomatic of colonization. That when you take away people's land, you take away their, their sovereign food ways, the ways that they have historically taken care of themselves. When you place them in, 
in neighborhoods that are food deserts, what options do they have to continue to have care? We have COFA migrants who've been denied health care for so long, who have actually not had access to Medicare or Medi-Cal. And so how does anybody build healthy wellness habits if for the entirety of their time in this country, they've actually never been able to access health? And so the, the inquiry we always placed on systems and not our people. The other aspect is that people talked about us being inherently unhealthy, our cultures, as the thing that you had to set aside in order to get healthy, in order to get safe. And we reminded them, we actually come from communities of equity and interdependence who deeply understand in a village setting, in a canoe setting, that everybody has a role to play. There isn't an individualism that any of us actually get to enjoy, uh, that how deeply interwoven we are. And in particular, when we talk about data, how frequently our communities are told that we're statistically insignificant, right? There are more Samoans here than there are in Samoa. There are more native Hawaiians here on the continent than there are in Hawaii. If we are not large enough here, we're not large enough anywhere to matter. So this notion of statistical significance is also really critical to understand that indigenous communities, native communities, who've always had these practices of coordinated community care are also the miner's canary of equity. Things that would inconvenience more resourced communities, communities with more power and institutional capital, devastate our communities. That you didn't have to look very far as we were actually taking our lessons not from California, but actually from Navajo Nation, who, when the vaccine was available, chose to vaccinate their Navajo speakers first. They said, we need these people to go first because they're going to carry this on. We need them to survive. And so the other critical piece of when I needed to figure out how to take care of our communities, systemically, we went to our own people. I think my, my mom and my sister, who are both nurses, who after working 16-hour shifts, would come home and then explain in Samoan to church members, this is what your doctor meant. This is what they said. I really appreciate what Camille had lifted up, this notion of what it means to start in language first and then translate into English. Because when we start from Samoan, there's an oratory protocol that dictates and starts from a place of equity because that's actually already embedded in our language and our oral tradition. And so wanting to make sure that we're the starting place and not an afterthought because we know that's going to be the best way to get to equity. Thank you, Devai. And just a final question for the uh, remaining speakers. Just want to ask, especially UCSD Health, I think that's the term, right? It's not San Diego, it's, UC it's UCSD Health. Just thinking about building more equitable systems. I appreciate the kind of the dashboards, kind of early detection when problems creep up. But how about things like proactive things in terms of like pipeline diversity, like centering kind of community knowledge first instead of like trying to take corrective steps? Are, are there things that you're exploring from an institutional perspective that could design? better from a kind of human and community-centered design approach moving forward? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. And we actually do call it UC San Diego Health because we don't want to get confused with Santa Barbara. Um, and no offense to UCLA, but, you know, we're the leading healthcare delivery. Um, I thought we were the best in the West. Well, the yeah, best how do you best. measure best? Yeah. That's true. We don't see Medicaid patients. Well, that's another conversation. <laughs> So, we can have um, that conversation at dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, the conversation that, that you're uh, referring to is a really important one because um, as we look at how we're going to evolve as an institution, it starts from within. And that means our workforce and our, our labor force and, and the equity of the people delivering care as well as the patients that are receiving it. And so um, lots of credit to our CEO, Patty Mason, who recently appointed uh, Associate Chief Medical Officer and uh, VP of uh, Health Equity, Dr. Crystal Sine. And one of the things that Crystal is really um, bringing is that our true north as an organization is delivering high quality, equitable health care to our community. 
And we can't do that if we don't have people who speak natively, who, who um, resonate with community, who understand the cultural values. And so we're really recruiting and developing with intention to address these areas of disparity. Um, and that includes things like bringing uh, undergraduates into um, positions that we might not have hired into um, previously. Um, it, it still includes a lot of data. You know, there's a, a notion uh, that's been coined called techquity uh, or technologi technology equity. And uh, it's a um, concept that I think we're reaching for, but have a ways to go. I mean, when we launched the state's first vaccine superstation before the Dodgers Stadium, uh, <laughs> It was in partnership with San Diego County. This is County. how academics trash talk. This is like so interesting. <laughs> it, it was in partnership with San Diego County and uh, we launched it in five days so that we could get to our goal of delivering 5,000 vaccines a day back in January of 2021. And we accomplished it very quickly. And at the same time, because we had real time data on who was getting vaccinated, we found out that number one, we were um, uh, vaccinating people coming from higher socioeconomic areas. Number two, um, when we slice and dice the data by race, ethnicity, and language, real, uh, it wasn't actually race or ethnicity that was the biggest disparity, it was language. And it was really about how are we communicating, getting the information out in native languages. Uh, and then number three, uh, with our CEO support, we immediately launched uh, what we called MVUs, or mobile vaccine units. And the MVUs got out in the community to deliver vaccines, not in uh, a way where it was UC San Diego Health communicating, but in partnership with the local community um, organizations, the CBOs, who they were getting the word out. We weren't advertising. And it was so incredibly um, uh, effective. The Navajo Nation did a tremendous job vaccinating their populations. Imperial County did a tremendous job of vaccinating the Latinx population there. We had gaps and we took those strategies um, to really help to deliver healthcare in our region. And uh, you know, longer term, th there's a whole lot of labor and, and workforce implications that we've learned as well. I just want to add to that. Um, I think it's really important that we're thinking about our, our pipeline of, of next generation, but existing right now in our systems are people that are being impacted by the use of predictive analytics to start improving the healthcare system. And, and so that influences not only the decision makers, but it, it inf you know, there's, there's a connection to patients and to workflows. And all of these different stakeholders are influenced by these new technologies. And when, when a decision- could you, could you make that a bit more concrete? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can. So when there was a decision to use predictive analytics to improve the scheduling of, of patients in clinics, they ran a model to see who was likely to no-show. And guess what happens? Well, the model picks up people of color as not likely to show up, double books them, and doesn't deal with the reason that they can't make their appointment. Okay, so if you can kind of get people at the table who can foresee the social downstream implications of these decisions and then test the model and see how it works and then try to figure out what were the social determinants that are causing this and try to figure out how do we solve for that root cause and, and really think through these problems carefully. Camille, thanks for bringing that up. And I want to clarify, that was a great paper written by our colleagues at UC San Francisco. Um, but uh, we actually have 12 AI models in production to help with healthcare at UC San Diego. And it's overseen by uh, an AI committee that takes an ethics and just uh, approach. I know Dr. Neveker is a participant. Um, and it's explicitly because we want to um, ensure that we're aware of potential biases that are developed by these models. Every large data set has biases inherent in the data set. And if you don't acknowledge those, then you can end up with these unintended consequences that you're talking about. So I'm gonna open it up to questions from the audience. Um, and while I wait for you to come up with your question, I, ha I have a question. You know, oftentimes, getting back to tech, oftentimes we create new technologies and it's used for efficiency rather than equity, right? Because equity is much harder to do, right? W one time I went to this Bloomberg event and they said, oh, look at all the cool techno technological innovations that we're gonna fix cities. 
And I got there and I thought, oh, they're gonna deal with poverty and homelessness. And it was like potholes. Like really, you're gonna use all this power to address potholes? So my question is, are we, how do we know we're addressing equity and not using our technology to do other things? Like what are some measurable ways that you're gonna tell me we're dismantling this inequitable system with technology. Well, you go back to when I said we have one of the highest child poverty rates in the nation. So you go back into looking at measures of structural determinants. I also think that it's not, when I go to different rooms where I read the room and it's really not about equity, I talk about, I actually talk about efficiency and quality and that better data, data that really reflects the experience, the pain, the joys of people um, and the intersections that they live in, that that actually is more efficient in getting the types of services that people need. So that it's not an either or dichotomous, like, oh, I'm gonna just deal with efficiency. The problem is that we, we're dealing with efficiency for the average consumer. So that's part of the problem. And we're doing it so we can rank number one or number, <laughs> you know, like we're, we're gonna look like we're a really great health system, well, number one. But, no, and I'm saying that it's, it's why does UCLA, number one, are we being recorded here? I mean, guys, I don't We're recorded, but, but I love it. Keep uh, going. <laughs> because we don't see Medicaid patients in Westwood. You know, there's, there's the, the composition is different. It's going to be different from, I'm working with Martin Luther King Community Health Center, where they're seeing very, I mean, they're seeing diabetes patients where it's at the point of amputation because they're not getting great primary care. So it's, uh, so then we try to address it as an economist in doing risk adjustment. So let's do social factors. Let's do some kind of, you know, predictive modeling to get at at least paying providers to take care of complex patients, at least paying them for taking care of complex patients, socially complex and clinically complex. But all of this just becomes mumbo jumbo. <laughs> and so how do we do it? Well, we go back and look at the social determinants of health. How many people are unemployed? How many people are unhoused? How many people have child poverty rates? You know, how many people have green, you know, space, green access to green space? So I think that those those are the measures of what makes you know our society um, assure that there's well-being for all. Um, hi, so my name is Kun Nguyen. I'm a medical student here, and I've had. The, uh, the privilege of working at the UCSC Student Run Free Clinic, who and we work with a lot of undocumented immigrants. Um, I know that on May 1st, there was a rule change that now anyone over the age of 50 will get full Medi-Cal coverage. And so we are transitioning a lot of our you know, patients over to family health clinics or whatever system that will use them or that will use this Medi-Cal service. And it's great for the patients because they'll be able to be seen faster, get these services. But we're also getting a lot of um, hesitancy from our patients who come to free clinic because they know they will get um, services that it has health equity in mind where they will be working with students and doctors who speak their language. Um, and I... And it, it worries me as someone who has been following patients who are now transitioning to the system. And so I'm wondering what you all thought um, are thinking about how this change will affect kind of the shift in more people going to family health centers and then also how we can encourage our patients to trust the system that may not have necessarily, as you said, been very kind to them in the past. Well, first of all, thank you for volunteering the student-run clinic. Uh, we love the clinic. Um, secondly, I'm going to uh, take a circuitous but brief approach to uh, responding to your question. So you've mentioned um, Medi-Cal and the importance in our state. Um, we also talked about the likelihood of uh, the public uh, systems contributing to innovation. And I just can't stress that enough. You know, in the state of California, where Medi-Cal is a significant insurer, we get a lot of our money from the federal government. And the federal government gave us a waiver called the 1115 waiver. And through that, the PRIME program was born in the state of California. The PRIME program helped us to fund and drive a bunch of these equity efforts. In fact, uh, UC San Diego, among 35 safety net institutions in the state, ranks number one in the PRIME program. 
And I will say that uh, we're more proud as a leadership team of that than we are of our U.S. news rankings. <laughs> And I'm going to take Senator one more question sorry, because Senator at UCLA actually evaluated the Prime program, and yes, San Diego did well. Um, <laughs> l l let me make sure I finish the, the answer, though, which is that um, the federally qualified health centers that you're talking about, they do a tremendous job taking care of the Medi-Cal uh, covered patients, um, and they're reimbursed 4x as much. And so they have resources that we don't have to care for those patients, and that's a really important uh, piece of uh, data as well. Hi, sounds like might be the final question. Uh, Pauline Thorogood, I'm a trustee and also my background is data and analytics. Uh, so I was very intrigued by your point about um, and the opportunity around how large data sets have inherent bias. Well, that's true, but that's an opportunity. So what, given there's so many data sets, uh, what can we do to collaborate and also what's missing and how can we actually add to it? It's easy. It's just as long as we know what we need to look for to augment them so that the predictive analytics can actually deal with the root cause versus come up with these things that are like double booking, uh, people are not white because they can't make it. <laughs> so how can we actually help equity with the data sets? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's about um, it's about measures and it's about having truth through community voices and having some truth from direct. There's direct measurements, indirect measurements, and I know a little bit of this because I also work for Nielsen, where um, they're an insights company, and they they had they use big data, but they also had a panel, and so they they thought that their comparative advantage was they had like they had the direct um, survey work than with, the, with their big data work. And that's, so what I would suggest is, first of all, um, you know, talk to people, get communities, get to buy on one of those, <laughs> those commissions, um, that you should still and, have. And, and pay communities too, yeah. when you talk to them. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, and have, um, but you still should use surveys uh, because you need, you still need, um, you still need direct estimates or truth from people. Um, because if it's all about what their spending patterns are, or you know, the um, the big AI story was that showing that blacks didn't have um, you know access to care problems because they weren't spending that much when they looked at expenses. It's because they weren't giving care. But you know, so again, that there's that's part of the bias. And so, what's your measure? The first thing is, what's the measure? Um, and then making sure that all of these um, these auxiliary data sets, like your credit card statement, your finance statement, how you shop, um, you know, it's because it's, it's mostly a lot of banking that's also big data, that that is is augmented by some truth of direct estimates. So that's again, I'm, I'm talking from a a survey data producer point of view. Karthik, you want to? Yeah, so I'll just say a couple of words uh, to wrap up um, and, um, and then turn it to Maida to close uh, uh, today's session. We've talked a lot about data and the power of data and a very good point if we have choices of different types of data that let's not get stuck to one thing. But really kind of there are a couple of other things that have come up as threads in this conversation and in prior conversations too, which is, you know, what are our values? I've really found that interesting exchange in terms of we're number one in what. Mm -hmm. And often, when it comes to higher ed institutions, when it comes to health systems, there are these like rankings that are so misaligned with the values we purport to care about. And so how can we then change it so that the, the things that we, not only that we measure, but that we value, that give prestige, that get people promoted, that get people into CEO positions are not the kind of bottom line things that are that are totally at odds with our our values of equity and inclusion and all these other values, and that's so important. I remember um, Larry, I forget his last name, the uh, trans. Uh, Larry Frank. Larry Frank, right? In terms of the walkability score and the power of that, and how it changed the way you would think about urban design. But there are values that are underlying it that we have to keep in mind. We also need to think about power and disparities in power, right? And so, of course, as someone who believes in the power of data, it's data and research are not value-free. And they are not free from power either. And it's not just to acknowledge it, but to actually change the way we design these things 
so that we can um, get to equity. Final thing I'll say from California 100, I've been telling you before about our Campus Fellows Program. We have 35 applicants now, and uh, we still have a couple of weeks left. We're pleased to see some UCSD applicants, including I think some from, from this session here, but please do uh, apply for our Campus Fellows Futures Program. Um, in May 2023, we're gonna have a youth takeover in Sacramento with a set of youth manifestos and a collective manifesto for California's long-term future, channeling our commissioner Tavai. I mean, you have the power, you have the boldness. Let's just do this, right? Uh, and we need to elevate your perspectives as much as possible. So I'll end with that and turn yeah. it over to Mike. So Arlene and Marty, you weren't here when I introduced you earlier, so I'm gonna s just welcome you to Design at Large. Um, Marty and Arlene are both inventors of the cell phone. Marty was the original inventor. If you want to take a look at his book, Cutting the Cord, it's a fascinating read about how they actually did that. And also Arlene invented the jitterbug cell phone for older adults, mature adults. <laughs> um, so if you want to come up and talk to them afterwards, I'm sure they would, the students in the class can, you know, um, ask them questions. And um, after this, we are actually having a health tech demo upstairs in the design lab and I encourage you all to come up and check it out because just as you said you know we we are really thinking about how we design the future so that it is more equitable that through technology and um, and you know the design lab I'm so proud of my design lab faculty and students who you know could go out and and work in tech and can do and can and design you know things that make a lot of money but what they're trying to do is actually democratize access to healthcare and make it accessible and available to everybody regardless of their income and uh, their ability to pay. And so I encourage you to come up and, um, and take a look at, at some of the cool innovations and advances that we have here. So thank you.